1 Timothy chapter 4 this morning. I had not planned back at the beginning of the year to uh, have a lot of the breaks that I've had in this last chapter. So that wasn't my intention, and yet that's how it seemed to be the Lord laid out the calendar. So last week, um, uh, we were in God's Word. Um, Pastor Jared was preaching. This week, I'm preaching from 1 Timothy chapter 4. Um, next week, I'm going to be gone again, and so we're going to be away from 1 Timothy 4 next week. Uh, because I'll be out of town, and then it worked out in the calendar well to be here the next week, and then the following week after that, the 7th of September, the 8th of September, um, Dr. Les Olala is going to be here, and um, you, you need to hear him. Um, Dr. Olala was the president of the Bible College that I was at. Um, while I was there, he was president, he actually um, resigned as president uh, the year after I graduated, so, Dr. Olala was one of the most formative public figures in my life as far as philosophy and way of ministering. And so, you'll be blessed to hear him. Um, so, we'll be breaking up First Timothy, having a hard time kind of getting in the next several weeks. But then after that, after that in September, I'm not going anywhere and I'm planning to finish Timothy up by the end of the year. Um, and so that's what we'll be doing. Just give you a heads up. This isn't normal for us to be constantly alternating texts and preaching every week. First Timothy chapter 4, we're going to read verses 6 through the end of the chapter, verse 16, and then focus in on verses 11 through 13 this morning. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine whereunto thou hast attained. But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having a promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying. And worthy of all acceptation, for therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not that gift, the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed to thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Father, as we come to you and come to your word, may you truly speak to us through the word of God. May we hear your voice in the pages of Scripture, not audibly and not in some kind of mystical fashion, God, but may we really listen and obey your voice that we hear in the Word of God. I pray, God, that your Spirit would take these words and they would plant it deep into our heart and it would be the words of God and not the words of a man that we hear this morning. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We looked several weeks ago at verses 6 through 10. Um, we looked at the overview of 6 through 16, and you notice in verse 6, uh, Paul says, put the brethren in remembrance of these things, or literally, lay these things out before them over and over and over again. And then in verse 11, he says, these things command and teach. To lay these things out before the brethren is a gentle imperative. In the, in the language here. Uh, it's one of, uh, I wish you would do this. This would be a good thing. It's a command, but it's kind of a gentle imperative. But he changes the tone in verses, uh, verse 11 when he says, command and teach these things. This is the strongest imperative in the New Testament, and he's using very strong language. Okay, Timothy, lay these things out. But Timothy... 
command and teach these things. This is so valuable. But you see a significance there because you have these things and these things, right? And so the important thing in understanding this text of Scripture is understanding what these things are that we're commanded to lay out. I mean, it's commanded to lay out, put them in remembrance, and then to very strongly command and teach. I think if you look in the context here, it becomes clear that the things, these things we're talking about is first and foremost the danger of apostasy, the danger of those that will turn away from the truth. Command and teach these things. But if you look bigger than that in the broader picture of 1 Timothy, what will keep individuals from falling away, from departing from the truth, is cons a consistent diet of being taught in the gospel. Chapter 3 would tell us this. The truth, the mystery of godliness or the gospel is great and without controversy. This is the, these are the things he's talking about. So bigger picture, the gospel. Who Jesus is and what he has done. More narrow focus, specifically Timothy, those that are substituting the gospel, teaching the gospel for their myths and endless genealogies and fables and their own doctrines that they are bringing, the doctrines of men. The legalism that he find, we find in the first part of Timothy. Those that thought they knew the law and thought they could teach it but really knew nothing of what they were talking about. Keep reminding them of these things, these truths, the scripture, the gospel. Bring these things before the people. You see, it is the word of God. It is the gospel that Paul says is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Gentile. It is the gospel that is the power of God to sanctify. The gospel, knowing the truth, enables us to love the God of truth and therefore serve Him in truth. But it begins with knowing Him. This is the point of what he's saying. And so, as Paul often does in his epistles, but specifically in Timothy, he begins with a general concept, and then he'll become more specific. In 6 through 10, we have the general concept. Three things. What's the duty of a minister? What must a minister do if he's going to be good? A servant. It's very simple. Tell the truth, reject false things, and live the truth. Exercise yourself in godliness. That's it. You see, the model for pastoral ministry, as well as any ministry you might have as mothers and fathers, with, <clears throat> as parents, as husbands, wives, as as ministry or service we do to the work of the Lord in our work or wherever we are, it's simple. Tell the truth, reject false things, and live out the truth. And that's what Paul is trying to tell Timothy. It's simple, Timothy. You do these things, you do these three things, you will be a good minister. That's all it is. Now he gets more specific when he says command and teach these things. Now it all hinges on verse 10. Why put yourself through this? Because what does he say a minister can expect if he's going to tell the truth, reject false things, and exercise in godliness? What can he expect? Verse 10. Weary, bone-crushing labor. That sounds exciting. But let's not just stop there. What else can he expect? Insult, reproach, rejection, persecution. Therefore, we both labor and suffer reproach, he says here. This is what we have received from telling the truth, God's truth, rejecting what they believe that's wrong, and then trying to exercise in godliness, live it out. This is what we've, we've experienced. And so, Timothy, you can experience the same thing. But why continue then? Why do this? Why not just shut our mouths? Because it's not getting us anything good after all. Just bone-crushing labor and insults. Why? Because there is only one name, there is only one gospel by which men will be saved. And that is Jesus Christ. There is only one Savior. There is only one truth. There is only one way 
And so although we suffer reproach, although we are insulted, although we, are, we labor and it's painful and you have tears and you weep and you weep for those loved ones that will not receive the truth, and although as pastors weep and weep over those who wander from the truth, we keep telling the truth because there is only one Savior of anyone who will be saved, and it is Jesus Christ. So Timothy, the stronger command, verse 11, command and teach. Don't give up. Don't lose heart. Don't stop praying and don't stop telling God's truth. Command and teach these things. Brings us to our text this morning. Kind of a, I was running up to it since we've been skipping a little bit in between. Now that we're all on the same page, hopefully, let's look in this text of Scripture. You know, those in the public sphere, like Timothy was in the public sphere and Paul was in the public sphere of ministry, church life, religious life, or even otherwise, are under the scrutiny and attention of many. James uh, addresses this issue in chapter 3 of his letter saying, Let not many of you uh, become teachers. And he says the reason why we should not desire to be teachers or masters is because we will receive a greater judgment. Now, teachers, those who serve instructing people in the things of God, will not only face stricter accountability at the judgment seat of Christ, and that is for God to give that accountability. So Paul says often, we labor for the judgment seat of Christ because then God will reveal all things. But not only do they receive stricter accountability at the judgment seat of Christ for what they have said and done, whether they've told the truth and lived the truth, they will receive that, but also continually in this life face strict judgment and judgmentalism from both wolves and sheep. A child who has fallen and scraped up his knees and hands on the pavement cries most loudly when his father gets the tweezers and pulls each embedded rock from his bleeding flesh. And usually tries to shield and block his father from pulling the rocks out of the leg. And yet it is, it is not over. It's his dad who he imagined had loved him previously, although he's beginning to question that now, douses his wound with disinfectant, cleansing the wound, but not without painful shrieks. Still yet, he's going to tightly wrap that wound and bandage it, applying pressure on it. And the child has by now fully convinced himself that the treatment was worse than the original problem. And that his father, who says he loves him, is full of it. And I think that is often how we view God, our Heavenly Father, in this way. And we as His children. He is treating our wounds, cleansing our sins, and binding up our brokenness. And we cannot see what He is doing, because all we as consider is, this hurts. And we don't see what He's doing. If we have that tendency with God, whom we see not, how much more we are guilty of chastening and judging those earthly shepherds or pastors whom He has given us to lead and teach us the truth of God's Word, which often does sting like disinfectant, painfully aggravate like implements and tools, and bind like bandages. And so we scream and cry out, not necessarily against God, but against the ministers whom God has appointed to teach us. Paul experienced this. Timothy was experiencing this. It's the reality of being a minister, a good minister of Jesus Christ. They will kick and fight. An illustration I heard from a pastor one time who actually had raised some sheep. He said he finally understood the concept of shepherding when there was a sheep that kept wandering out of the pen. And one day he went out and the sheep was once again wandering out of the pen. It had broken down some things and he went and corralled the sheep. But the sheep saw him, took off running and tangled up in a barbed wire fence. It was bleeding. And so as the pastor got over there close to try to free the sheep, the, sh the sheep saw him and started kicking and kicking and biting and doing everything he could. And, and, and this pastor said he just audibly yelled out as loud as he could, Knock it off! I'm trying to help you! Of course, the sheep didn't understand what he was saying. And he was, at that time, he, in illustration, he said, I suddenly understood what Paul was talking about. <laughs> the reality is, we fight against God and we, uh, our heavenly shepherd, and we fight against those who are earthly shepherds at the same time. 
And that's why James says, be not many masters. <laughs> Be not many teachers. We receive a stricter judgment, a greater accountability. Yes, in the life to come, but even in this life now. A great accountability and responsibility rests heavily upon those who would be church ministers in the public sphere. And a great accountability and responsibility lies upon those men and women who have been saved for some time. And even if they don't have the official title of shepherd, are commanding and teaching those younger than them. A great accountability and responsibility rests upon fathers who must teach their children and mothers who must teach their children. A great accountability and rests upon every servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is a greater judgment, a greater strictness. The world will give you a greater judgment and strictness. You'll, you'll fall, you'll make a mistake, you'll sin grievously, and you'll hate it, and you'll go to your, your co-workers, and you'll try to apologize for your sin, and they'll say, I thought you were a Christian. And you say, yes, I fail, and they don't want to hear anything of it. There is a greater accountability, a greater judgment on those who would be servants of Jesus Christ. Why? Because the Bible tells us, to whom much is given, much is required. And those who hear and know and believe the gospel have been given much. We have been granted access to the throne of God in prayer. We have been given an understanding in the Spirit of God that illuminates His truth for us. We have been given a fellowship of saints who understand our struggle and our weaknesses and our faith. We have been, to been taught by knowledgeable pastors. We have been given the command to minister reconciliation to all. We have been given much, and so much is required, and great accountability and strictness is there. With that in mind, Paul is addressing Timothy, whose duty as a minister is to tell the truth of God, refute false teaching, and exercise himself in godliness. Timothy, who is young, timid, sickly, and apparently worried about fulfilling that very duty. That God has given him to command and teach. This is the only way to explain why Paul tells Timothy in this chapter, which is the most intensely personal part of this letter, why several times there are the imperatives to Timothy. Timothy, lay these things out. Timothy, command. Timothy, teach. And everything from verse 11 on down is imperative after imperative and command after command. And Timothy's not unusual. Timothy represents probably most pastors I've ever met. The response of Timothy is not known to this bold imperative by Paul. We don't know what Timothy had to say. We're only able to understand from what Paul wrote Timothy because that's what God has given us. But we do see this, and I noticed this, and maybe you did as well. As soon as he gives this bold command, command and teach, do you notice that in verses 12 through 16... He addresses some obvious arguments that Timothy might bring up. You notice that? Look in the text of Scripture and, and, and notice that. That Timothy may give stumbling blocks that may lie in the way of Timothy commanding and teaching, being a good minister of Jesus Christ. We know that even the great man of God, Moses, gave excuses when he was given a commission by God. It would not surprise us that Timothy might also have some excuses or that we have some excuses when God tells us, tell my truth, refute false teaching, and exercise yourself in godliness. Command and teach these things. Be a good minister. I believe Timothy might say from Paul's response here, I'm too young. Who will listen to me? Or maybe he would say, who am I that, even, that, they, that even sh they should listen to? What qualifications do I have? Maybe verse 14, that's what Paul's talking about. Or maybe verses 15 through 16, if they really knew me, you know, if they really saw me, <laughs> saw my heart, saw how slow of growing I am, saw how little progress I have made. I'm in, I'm in no shape ready to lead these people, Paul. I can't do it. They have no reason to listen to me. Whether or not this is what Timothy thinks or whether his responses would be these, I don't know. But I do know from the inspired text that each of these possible excuses or stumbling blocks are clearly identified by the Apostle Paul. He addresses those very three stumbling blocks. By the way, Paul does this a lot. 
we went through, for three years we studied through the book of Romans. He constantly uh, prefaced an argument before it was ever given. And he'll say, you might say, or some say, he'll, he'll do that. He, he did that constantly. One of the most famous is in chapter 6 where he says, what then, sh what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He, we don't know if they said that, but he's, he's jumping ahead and saying, wait, wait, wait. Now I just said that where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. And I know what they're going to say as a response to that. So I'm going to preempt what they're going to say with, wait a second, are we really going to say this? Same thing in chapter 9 when, when Paul starts talking about the sovereignty of God. And he says, and he talks about who art thou that repliest against God. Well, who's he talking to? Who replied against God? It's, no, it's simply this. He knew what man would say. <laughs> this is what they're going to say when I say this. And so I'm going to say this. The Holy Spirit was giving him this. This is from God. And I believe he does the same thing here in 1 Timothy. He knows Timothy. Timothy has been working with Paul. He's been mentored by Paul for around 15 years by this point. Timothy began following Paul as a young man without a father. Well, without a father present in his life. He had a father. But at 15 years old, Timothy went and began traveling with Paul at the insistence of his mother, or at least the support of his mother, who was a believer. 15 years old, he starts traveling with Paul. Now, traveling with a man like Paul, I imagine, would do two things. One of two things. One... It would either make you the most fearless person ever. I mean, you saw the guy get stoned and then stand up afterwards, dust himself off, and go into the next city. I mean, you saw the guy, by the time this is being written, by the way, you saw the guy shipwrecked, have a snake bite his arm, and he just shakes it off and then continues to eat. So, following Timothy around would either make you the most fearless person there ever was or make you the most fearful person there ever was. In other words, you might go this way. Do I really want to do what he's doing? Do I really want to be shipwrecked? Do I really want snakes by me? Do I really want the stones pounding on my head? Now, I don't know if Timothy thought that way. We don't know. I'm just thinking of myself in such a situation. I'm pretty sure that I would respond with, given following this guy from 15 years old, I would have probably responded with, you know what, Paul, I think I have a job back home waiting for me. By the way, most did that. Most did. Paul says that in 2 Timothy when he's writing to Timothy. No one stood with me when I made my set my defense. Demas forsook me, having loved this present world. He's not here. Alexander, Alexander and Hymenaeus, they, they didn't stick it out. They left. Timothy, you're all I got. What would this do to a young man? And I think Paul, within the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, understands this, and so he addresses these stumbling blocks that Timothy might have as a servant of Jesus Christ. What's holding you back, Timothy? Here, here's three things that might be holding Timothy back, and Paul's going to debunk them. He's going he's to say, no, they don't, they don't count. Just like God did with Moses when he was at the burning bush, and Moses said, I can't speak. Who am I? Who should I say sent me? I, I, I'm not qualified for this. I find it fascinating because Paul and Paul's response under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is similar to God's response to Moses. He doesn't come to Timothy and say, No, Timothy, you're a good guy. People will like you at Ephesus. They're going to love what you're going to say. You just tell them, You know what? They're probably going to invite you over for dinner every week. You know, by the way, that, that happens. When I was in, in, in school studying for the ministry, not a lot of people told me that people are going to really get angry with what you say. <laughs> I think they were afraid that if they told these young men, they would just run. I don't know. Maybe people did, and I just wasn't listening. I don't know. But Paul doesn't do that with Timothy. 
he, he sh shoots it straight, okay? Labor and reproach, Timothy, that's what you're going to get. And so the possible response of Timothy, we're just going to look at the first one this morning. What response might he have? What's the first stumbling block that might get in the way? Too young. Can't do it. They're not going to listen to me. In fact, why would they listen to me? They're not, I'm not you, Paul. Too young. But before we get to that, let me back up just a moment and, and set some things here from verse 11. Because I wanted to focus in on this. Because I think in saying I'm too young, they won't listen to me. I think in saying that, it's missing the content of verse 11. It's, Timothy would be, if he was to say that, he'd be missing what Paul is saying in verse 11. Command and teach these things. Now, just follow with me on this for a moment. The word command is the word announce, the word we get angel from. Announce. The word teach is the word line upon line, systematic, <coughs> relentless teaching. They're both imperatives. The word command, as I said, announce is the idea of public, loudly public announcement. It's not the idea of a private discipleship. Rather, this is pointing out to the public life. This is pointing out to the, you speak loudly when you speak, Timothy. You don't hold back. You teach these things, you speak loudly and you speak accurately. God's truth. But does not this imperative to command and teach imply dogmatism and a body of truth that does not change, that can be relied upon for accurate information regardless of whether or not the audience accepts it? Isn't it fascinating? He doesn't say, um, ask them questions, find out what they like, and then tell them what they want to hear. Does not this imply when he says, announce it, that there is something that can be announced? Does it not imply when he says, teach it, that there is something we know that can be taught? And I say this because on, in our society today, this concept of dogmatic, propositional statements, thus saith the Lord, is not very popular. It's not popular to say that. How do you command and teach possibilities? How do you command and teach theories? How do you command and teach suppositions? If we're all on a journey to discover the truth that works best for each of us, who then can command or teach anything? All I can do is share my ideas and smile and say, whatever works for you is fine. But that's not what the Holy Scripture teaches us. The Bible informs us quite clearly that we have an objective God who has given us objective truths and commands who has informed us of absolute realities that never change and principles that last forever and cross language barriers and geographical barriers. In other words, the imperative of verse 11 clearly implies that there is dogmatic theology. There is that which is true and that which is false. And saying, this is what God says, and it is true, and this is false, is the business of ministers of Jesus Christ. Paul doesn't express to Timothy that somehow dogmatism in who and what God says is, is, is arrogant or proud. No, it's not proud for Timothy to say, this is true. But rather that truth is to be proclaimed and taught, there is a growing and zealous movement in our tolerance-infused culture that makes those who make dogmatic statements concerning what is true or false, good or bad, right or wrong, as the enemies of progress in healthy societies. Even within professing Christianity, there are some that suggest that dogmatic truth and propositional statements are the height of arrogance. My favorite phrase that people use when they say this is, well, who am I to say... They answer that and then they fill in the blank with something they don't really want to say is true or not. Who am I to say he's wrong? Who am I to say that's true? Who am I to say that's false? The reality is, no, we're no one to say. But God's Word does say. And so when we say, thus saith the Lord, it's not arrogance. It's trust. Amen. We believe what God says. 
You see, those humility is found, that they think, they suppose that humility is found in not really knowing anything definitively. Or at least not being willing to act as if we know anything for sure. But we're ready to question everything and not to disenfranchise anyone by saying that their theology is flawed or heretical. And that's just plain foolish. We have a dogmatic God who has given us revealed truth that can be understood, trusted, and obeyed. And we, along with Timothy, must not be swayed by this supposed false humility of uncertainty as being superior to, thus saith the Lord of the Holy Bible. So, Timothy must not be afraid to speak the truth, even if dogmatic theology is not popular. But suppositions and myths and endless questions are all the rage. I wonder if things have changed so much from the first century when Timothy wrote this and today. He is commanded to dogmatically know and proclaim God's revealed truth, the Scripture. But then going ahead to this first problem, because that sounds like something that's awfully uncomfortable to do. You know, there's two things. that, If you want to offend people in your community, you talk about politics or religion. Well, you can leave politics. I really don't care. But it's offensive to talk about the gospel. Especially when you make strong statements. I'm not talking about angrily or without love. But make strong statements to say this is true. It's not going to make you popular. Especially when you add to that the dynamic that you're just a young man. <laughs> Command to teach these things and I can just hear Timothy saying I'm not you. <laughs> Timothy was a young man. This verse makes it clear. Although the word for youth or youthfulness has been said by some to extend into one's 40s, the Greek word for youthfulness, the most common use of the word is that of that time between adolescence and the 30s. Since Timothy had been with Paul about 15 years, and since it is assumed Timothy living with his mother was a teenage boy, most conservative Bible students place Timothy in his early to mid-30s. So, since I'm in my, 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 my mid-30s, I am perfectly fine with being told that I am still a youth. Feels kind of nice to have the Bible support that idea. But, he's a youth. Now, seriously though, I get Timothy's struggle. I understand it. I empathize with him. I feel like I know enough and have had enough experience in the Word and in life and in family to not have to rely upon others for decision making, but still woefully inexperienced and lacking in knowledge in life to make the right decision. In other words, I, in this time of my life, I feel like I'm supposed to make the decisions, but I don't feel like I'm old enough to make the decisions. I think Timothy's there. Yet, like Timothy... <laughs> I've heard some well-meaning souls tell me that they would like to have children when they feel mature enough to properly care for them and raise them. And after recently having our fourth child, my response is, when that day comes that you feel prepared, you'll be too old and weak to pick them up and hold them. I, there is much to value in youth, but there is also much danger in youthfulness. In 2 Timothy, Paul tells Timothy to flee youthful lusts. And evidently, Timothy felt this acutely. Whether or not there were individuals in Ephesus who were actively attempting to undermine his authority when Paul placed him in leadership or not, we do not know. But what we do know is that one of the things that Tim was supposed to command and teach involved rebuking established elders who were not fulfilling their duties well, but even had been sinning openly in the congregation. Chapter 6, he'll get into that. Now just put yourself in Timothy's shoes. Who is this young apprentice of Paul anyways? And what gives him the right to think that he can instruct us? Why his beard is barely visible. He speaks less powerfully. And where are his experiences that we can know he is worthy to live listening to? Whether Timothy faced this particularly or not, we, know, we don't know, but we, clearly we know that Paul expects Timothy to face this. I believe Paul expected him to face it because Timothy had seen or sorry, Paul had seen Timothy facing this. Timothy and Paul 
understood this was a reality, the scrutiny of the greater judgment that James speaks of. So what is the answer then? What is the answer he gives to this problem of youthfulness? I love this. I'm going to give the overview, then we're going to dive into it particularly. Here's the answer. Timothy, live the truth and tell the truth. Live the truth and tell the truth. Age is not what matters. Truth is. We have an example of many times where the Scripture describes the gray head as being honorable because of the experience. And it ought not be something that we let go of and, and exchange the wisdom of age for the impetuous nature of youth. Yet at the same time, we have an examples like this in Timothy and examples like that of Job where the aged men could not give Job accurate truth. But it was the young man who held his peace who gave the truth to Job in the end. And we have in that same book of Job, it says that this young man said, wisdom is not only for the aged. Because wisdom is not an age-specific issue. Wisdom is a truth-based issue. We know truth, and that's what we must be looking for. First thing he tells Timothy here is live the truth of Christ-like godliness. Live the truth, Timothy. Look, look at verse 12. Let no man despise thy youth. Despise there. Look down on. Insult. Reject you because you are young. Let no man despise you because of your youthfulness. No, Timothy, you don't let them. That's a command, by the way. It's a soft imperative. That's a command. Don't let them. Stand up and say, hey, don't despise my youth. Wait. Read the rest of the scripture. That's not actually what he says. What do you do? How do you keep them from despising your youth? When you are young... And you know what you're saying is true, but you're being looked at with disapproving glances the whole time. And as Timothy's situation, you know not only are you going to have to speak God's truth to these people, but some of the most aged people in the congregation, aged pastors in the congregation, you're going to have to stand up in front of them and say, you are sinning and you need to repent or we're removing you from the assembly. Okay, sounds like a great job for a 30-year-old to do. I can just see Timothy saying, Paul, we'll just put table that one until you get here. Chapter 6, we look at that. No, don't assert your authority. Don't run away from your authority. Be an example. Live it. Model it. The word example there is the word pattern. Be a pattern. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers. Be an example of or showing what believers actually are. Show what a believer is. They don't want to listen to you because you're young? Show them what truth does. Show them what the gospel does in a life. Show them what Christ does. And you won't have to worry about that. Not tell them that you have the truth and they better listen to you or get out. Not convince them that you are really smart and learned and experienced, but show them that the same Spirit of Christ that has guided the aged apostles into the truth is the same Spirit of Christ that is working in you. Be a pattern. What is the pattern Timothy should consider as valuable that he should pattern his life after? I thought long and prayed much about why these virtues are listed. You notice these patterns here. Be an example of the believers. Then he lists these things. In word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. He lists these. Why these? You ever do that when you read Scripture? Why'd you give us that? Why not this? Or why not this over there? Why those specific ones? Why, why those? What's, what's the point? Uh, I thought about this. At first, I wondered if there was some kind of connection or progression in them. Like, you know, they build on the next one. Working from the simple to the great or the great to the simple, but I couldn't make sense of that. Then I wondered if maybe these are virtues that counter the natural vices of young men. Maybe young men have a hard time with word, with, with lifestyle, with love, with spirit, with faith, with purity. Uh, that, that seemed possible. 
maybe these are just difficult for young people, but I had to disregard that interpretation in the end because I think we all struggle with these virtues, not just young people. Then I thought, maybe these are leadership virtues. You know, leaders must have these things like chapter 3. This seems to make sense, and I do believe these virtues must be present in good ministers, leaders' lives, but further, they have to be present in everyone's life. But then I considered this, and I believe this to be the reason why these specific virtues are listed and commanded for Timothy to show a pattern of. Because these are simple, foundational virtues that touch on every area of life. The idea of holistic. There is no aspect of life where what we say, how we live, our love, our new creation, spirit, what we believe in purity or holiness does not affect for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. In other words, be an example of word in the family, in the work, in the church, in your reactions, in your actions. Be an example of how one lives, conduct in what you say to your kids as well as what you say to the older people in the church. Be an example in faith by believing when you have and when you don't have. The idea here is that these basic virtues or these foundational virtues that are given by the Spirit of God impact all of our life. Every aspect of our life. And so he's not just telling Timothy, be an example at home, or be an example in the pulpit, or be an example here. He's saying, be an example in these foundational virtues of Jesus Christ that will in turn manifest themselves in every circumstance and area of life that you find yourself in. In other words, you be an example in these virtues, you be a pattern in these virtues, you'll be blameless before the eyes of these men who are trying to despise your youth. But something else I noticed... We see these virtues as essential to Christ-like living and evident fruit of salvation. Furthermore, growth in these particular graces is evidence of one who is abiding in Christ, who has a real and vibrant walk with Jesus. Jesus, notably because these graces, and catch this, this is important, are clearly evident in the life of Jesus. In other words, this is what Jesus looks like. So Timothy, since your calling is to be a good minister of Jesus Christ, show them Jesus. Let no man despise your youth. Show them Jesus. Show them Jesus. We speak of Jesus, but do we show a dying world that Jesus that we announce? Is there a disconnect between what our lips are proclaiming and what our active lives are demonstrating? There ought not be, show them Jesus, who himself was but a youth, and their judgment and criticism will have no legitimate ground if you show them Jesus. How can a young minister, a young servant, convince the doubters that he is devoted to God's truth, that he is a capable minister, by showing a pattern of the young Messiah himself, Jesus, the Son of God. James tells us that a perfect man is able to bridle his tongue, his words. Jesus, the one and only, absolutely perfect one, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Show them Jesus. Be a pattern in word. Jesus told the Pharisees that they were whitened tombs filled with dead men's bones, but Jesus' conduct, His manner of living, was always pleasing in contrast to the Father. So show them Jesus. Be a pattern in conduct. Paul said that the greatest virtue is love in 1 Corinthians 13. And truly, we are commanded to love God with all of our being and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And that is the mark of discipleship. It's love for one another. But Christ demonstrated, Christ demonstrated His love while sinners rage. Show, show, them, show them Jesus and love while they rage. Be a pattern of love. The scripture tells us that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed, passed away, all things are become new. The concept here of being a pattern in spirit, it most likely means that of the inner man, the spirit. Rather that we have a spirit of holiness and truth, where we once had a spirit of idolatry and lust. Jesus demonstrated perfectly what the new man looked like. Show them Jesus. Be a pattern in spirit. Show them the new man in Christ. Paul writes that whatever is not of faith is sin. 
And that faith is the only means to knowing the fullness of God's salvation by His grace. Jesus lived with absolute demonstration of faith in His Father doing His will without fear. So show them the faith of Jesus. Walk in faith and be a pattern of absolute trust and rest in the will of the Father. The Scripture tells us that without holiness no man will see God. There was none pure, spotless, and sinless like Jesus. None is holier. Show them Jesus. Live a pure, holy life by the grace of God as you provide a pattern of purity. Timothy, you may fear being young, but it isn't about you. It isn't about how old you are or how young you are. It's about God's unchanging truth. You may fear what men will say because of your age, but do not think of that. Think of Christ and show His pattern of godliness in these virtues. Demonstrate the truth of Christ with your whole life. But it is not enough to simply live out the truth with your public life, which is what he is saying in verse 12. Let no man despise thy youth, but be a pattern. That's public, right? Be a pattern. Show them Jesus. But he goes on in verse 13, and he speaks not just of showing them Jesus, but speaking. Once again, we're still in the context of the public responsibility here. Timothy, you must not only show them Jesus, be a pattern in these virtues, but when you enter the assembly and boldly and loudly proclaim the truth with your mouth. This is why Paul immediately moves in the context from the call to be an example of believers in these virtues to the public speaking ministry of Timothy. And I believe the order is important. I don't believe men should boldly proclaim to give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine when their pattern of life contradicts the reading, exhortation, and doctrine. And that's what he's pointing out here. He moves from the pattern of life to the words one speaks. No doubt the most important and powerful ministry a servant of the Lord has in the church of the living God is the pulpit ministry. What he says when he opens God's word. This is no small task to stand before God's people and to command and teach with power and authority. You don't want them to despise your youth. You want them to hear you. Why else do you speak if you don't want them to hear what God has said? If you don't want them to be about, think about you then don't make it about you. When you get into the public assembly, when you get behind the pulpit, when you speak, don't make it about you. Make it about the message you're delivering. The truth that you are speaking. But don't be just content to live out the godliness in silence, but in the public eye, speak out God's truth. Have a word-based Ministry. That's what he's talking about in verse 13. Still the same context as we're considering the public ministry of the word. And until Paul should come, Timothy had a chief job to engage in. And this is what it is. He says, Till I come, give attendance or do attention to these three things. He says, First, give attention to reading. Now, he's not talking about becoming a good reader. Being able to be good with phonics and spelling and stuff like that. In the context, he's talking about the public ministry and what he's speaking of here is, till I come, give due attention. Make this chief in the assembly the public reading of God's Word. The word there, uh, anagonosko, is in First Thess that's the word uh, reading right there. In First Thessalonians 5.27, it's public reading of the epistle to all the brethren. In Colossians 4.16, the same word is used three times. It means to publicly read the letter to all. In 2 Corinthians 3.14, it's once again used publicly reading the Old Testament in the synagogue. In Acts 13.15, is the public reading of the law by the priests in the synagogue. In Luke 4.16, Jesus stands up to read the law and the prophets in the synagogue, and this word is used. 
And these are all the times it's used in the New Testament. It's not used any other time this word is. So every time it's used in the New Testament, it's referring to the public reading of the Scripture. If you go further and look in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, whenever it talks about the Old Testament reading the Scripture, this word is used in the Greek. So it's very clear that we're not talking about private reading here, we're not, which is important and good to do. We're not talking about just, till I come, Timothy, make sure you just read the Bible in your closet. No, he's saying in the public assembly, until I come, this is what the assembly ought to look like. This is what ought to have chief responsibility. Get up and read God's Word. Tell them what it says. So what Paul is commanding Timothy is one who is first living the truth of God is to stand before the people of God and to publicly read God's Word for all to hear. It is an attempt to obey this command that we, the reason why we, we read a call to worship publicly as we begin each Sunday. It is an attempt to obey this command of God that we read the Scripture before we preach on Sunday. Somehow we, we tend to lose the value in the assembly worship for the concept of everyone reading the Word of God and have resort, have resorted in both music and word to sort of a, a private encounter with God. But Paul wants Timothy to clearly and pain, pain, plainly read God's Word for all to hear. And believe me, brothers and sisters, it is an art. It is something we ought to be passionate about when we read the Word of God publicly. Excuse me for a little bit of a, a, a rabbit trail, a concern I have, but when you go to an assembly and the person gets up to read the Word of God and you're asleep before the sermon's even started because they read, of God, they read the Word of God as if it is a dictionary or as if it is an encyclopedia. This is the living, breathing breath of God. This idea of publicly reading the Word of God, we're reading for people to understand it and receive it. And so we had to read it in such a way that they will understand it and receive it. Now, I would not go so far as Charles Spurgeon, who said that a man should not read the Word of God unless he has a large barrel chest. They didn't have sound systems in those days. And his point was, if a man gets up to read the Word of God and people can't hear it, it was of no value. That's the point here. Now, it's not... Don't get into the details. i use some illustrations here. The point is that the Word of God has the primary place in the assembly. It's the primary place. And so what do we do? We read it. We read it. But that's not all. All three of these are word-based. But the second thing, you read it. He says, until I come, give attention to exhortation. Some uh, tr uh, Bibles that you may have may have as a you know, little cross-reference or something to try to help explain some words. And in the Bible I have, it says right below that with a little star to tell me to look lower, it says the word preaching there. Preaching. This idea of the, is the same word as encouragement or to come alongside, but here, as in the rest of the context, it's not private exhortation or private encouragement, but public. And how does one do this? Well, call out people from the pulpit? Customize preaching to one person? How do you call, come alongside when you're of an assembly? No, I don't believe so. But in explaining that which is read with passion, precision, and practicality. Explaining what is read. Exposition of the Word of God. Preaching. Proclamation. Read it, and then come alongside and explain it. It's the meaning of the word there. Later on, Paul will say to the same young man, Timothy, in 2 Timothy, preach the Word. Read the Word, then preach the Word. Bring exhortation from it. Woe unto the church, the people, or pastors who diminish the public proclamation of the Word of God, the exhortation, by elongating the music and undermining the sermon. Woe to the church that is afraid of propositional sermons which pronounce the Word of God, explain the Word of God, and provide implications from the Word of God in favor of good feelings or emotional stirrings of dramatic reenactments and sharing of personal feelings on the matter. Who cares about that? We need to see Jesus and we need to hear Jesus. That's what we need. Give attention to the exhortation. 
And then the third thing he says here, give attention to the teaching. This is not to contrast teaching and preaching or exhortation as if preaching were to stir the heart and teaching touches the brain. No, all, all good preaching, exhortation is filled with teaching. And all good teaching preaches. The idea here is that until he comes, Paul wants Timothy to give attention to explaining all of what God says. The word teaching there is the word systematic, step by step, paragraph by paragraph, everything God has said. It was Paul who said to the Ephesians the first time he left that he had a clear conscience because he did not shun to declare unto them the whole counsel of God. Brothers and sisters, that is why in seeking to have a word-based ministry here at Grace, we read the Word, we explain or exhort with the Word, and we do it all. We go through it, book by book, paragraph by paragraph, so that we're not leaving things out that God has said. This is a command that He gives to Timothy. So to sum up these public duties of the minister, we could say, it's not about you, Pastor Timothy. It's not about you, Pastor Matt. It is about the Word of God and the truth that is within that Word. They may despise your youth, but it's not about you. It's about the ministry of the Word of God that gives life to dead men and gives light to blind people. That's what it's about. So give them the Word of God, first in your example and then in your words. And don't worry about what they think or say. Brothers and sisters, we know that Jesus Christ has given His church, who we are if we are resting in Christ alone by faith alone, He has given His church His holy word, the Bible. We know the truth. The truth has set us free from sin and death. We are delighting in our call to glorify God as our ultimate aim. God has organized and preserved for us His will revealed in the Word of God, the Bible. Therefore, our responsibility is simple. To live as a good minister of Jesus Christ. Show Jesus as a pattern of godliness of what we read in the Word. Show Jesus as a pattern of godliness in Word, conduct, love, spirit, faith, and purity. And speak Jesus as we read the Scripture. Provide exhortation and teach. Now, pastors and churches must have as their chief duty the ministry of truth, both in living and speaking. Must not neglect this. But let me point this out as we come to the end. What is needed for pastors like Timothy, what is needed for me, is desired in everyone who is a servant of Jesus Christ. You may not be a pastor, and you may not be young. This text is no less applicable, because Christ Jesus has given you much grace and mercy, and to whom much is given, much is required. So be an example of the believers. Live out the abiding in Christ as a display of God's life-altering grace. And speak out God's truth as clear proof that God's truth does indeed abide within you. If you're a saint, if you have learned of the grace of God, you're a minister of Jesus Christ. Will we live consistently with our place of service by a pattern of living and proclamation of truth that exalts Jesus Christ? Let's pray.